Hey guys, are you ready to dive into a new study? We're calling this one Death and All of His Friends. We're going to take a, an extended look at the way that sin operates, what it is, how it affects us, what it does to the world around us, our relationships, our identity. And hopefully, as a result of this, we're going to be driven more into and compelled more uh, by the character of Jesus and his ability to work against sin and to help us find wholeness. So, with that in mind, what is sin? So, a lot of times we, we define sin as personal failures, mistakes we make, things that we do bad. Maybe you've come up with a definition similar to that. And that's certainly a part of the definition. The Bible traces through sin as a series of, of failures, certainly. But there's something more at work here. The Bible paints a wider and broader picture of sin, one that we need to take very seriously. You see, the Bible introduces sin, the fall of humanity, through introducing a character, an agent, someone who wants to make us sin. Before the sin began, we're introduced to a shady figure we call the serpent. So let me set the stage for what we're about to read. We're just going to read this first exchange between the serpent and Eve. And before we get there, I just want to paint this context. The opening chapter of Genesis traces through God's creation of the cosmos that was good. Everything was good. It was very good. His creation of humanity. This is crown jewel. Chapter 2 traces through the installment of these representative figures, hum humans, Adam and Eve, into his garden temple to represent him, to cultivate the earth, and to expand his reign into the, into the cosmos. And here, in chapter 3, we were introduced to the notion of sin, to the concept of the fall of humanity. It begins with a new character in the mix, an agent who is seeking your demise. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? But the woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, You must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. You will certainly not die, the serpent said to the woman, For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. We're going to dive into the next part of this story, in our next session, but I just want to meditate here on this new character, this problematic figure in the Garden of Eden. There's no backstory given at this point in the biblical narrative. There are other passages throughout the Bible that paint a little bit of m possible areas where this figure came into the world. What is his origin? And we can address those at some point. But what I want you to get at, though, is that there is an agent who wants us to sin. Sin, as, as at this point in the Bible and the, the unfolding revelation of God, it is not simply the failures of Adam and Eve that make up the fall. There is an agent. There is a figure. There's a bad guy who wants them to fail. So I, I'm, we need to hear that in our understanding of sin and the idea of spiritual warfare. We need to know that it's not simply our mistakes that the Bible presents as the problem in our relationship with God though that is part of it. But it is also an enemy who seeks our severing of our relationship with God. But the serpent, it's an introduction to a new character, and he's cunning and clever. He's, that's the word, the adjective used here. Now, is cunningness and cleverness bad? No. In fact, in the Proverbs, it's used positively, and it's often translated as prudence. Even Jesus tells his disciples to be as clever as serpents in their mission work. 
And so we have this really interesting <laughs> tension here uh, that the, the, the main architect of the fall, it seems, and his highlight of clever, is this meant to be bad? Well, in Job 15.5, it does seem that cleverness, this cunning, is related to the tongue. And so we see words aren't bad. As, as James put it, it's, it's a, an important part of the body. Let's read here. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? Right, so it's not, words actually spoke the universe into existence. God spoke and there was, right? And, and, and when we confess Christ, we do it with our tongue. What is the announcing of the gospel without words? Words are part of, of who we are and it's part of, part of what we do. Uh, and it's important. And so it, to say that cunningness and cleverness you know, that are somehow pitted against God, that's not the point. The point is, how are you going to use your words? for your own good or in line with God's good. The serpent wants to shed the most unsavory light on God's words. He's attempting to get Eve and Adam to distrust in the words of God, to distrust in what they believe God said or why he would say it. Do you see here? This is cunning deception and this is the beginning of sin. We need to remember here that evil is only a parasite of good. It cannot exist on its own. It takes what is good and it defiles it. It corrupts it. It reshapes it for its own twisted purposes. Think of cancer, for example. It's made up of cells in the body that go rogue. They become free radicals and they begin to attack the body. That cancer cannot exist without the good cells of the body that are then compromised and turned against itself. Evil is like that. Sin is the corruption of God's goodness working against God and against our own good. As Switchfoot so eloquently puts it, the shadow proofs the sunshine. Platinga, a theologian and philosopher, he calls sin... The vandalism of shalom. Shalom, the idea of peace or wholeness, completeness, is a really rich and vibrant concept throughout all of Scripture. When it's vandalized, when it's broken, when it's fractured, that's what sin is. It takes the wholeness and completeness of God's creation and His design, and it attempts to corrupt those things. For example, in the garden is introduced the idea of sex. Sex between a, a man and a woman in covenant relationship makes humans made in the image of God. There's something beautiful, and God designed it to be good, the goodness of sex. And yet, think of the corruptions of human sexuality that are so present in human society. So in a way, there's nothing original to sin. I'm not saying that there's not such a thing as original sin. I'm saying there's nothing original to it. It doesn't create. It only compromises good creation. And so let us not believe that deceit, that cunning, those words purpose towards destructive ends. That's where sin begins, where we begin to distrust the words of God. So let us cling to his words better than Adam and Eve did. What sin seeks to do is to take something originally good and to corrupt it. And here we have an agent about this business, the serpent. And so we must begin our study of sin as the Bible does, an awareness of the agency, that there is something, someone, who wants you to fail, who wants you to, to, to twist God's words and to distrust God, to believe the worst about God. And this is the beginning of evil in the biblical account. Yes, Adam and Eve make a grave mistake. But before the mistake was the agent who willed their mistake, 
who influenced it, who guided it, through cunning deception. So maybe we can develop a better ear for picking out and hearing the forked tongue, the deception, the voices that cause us to distrust God, the voices that seek to compromise His goodness and our own. So, let's call Him on it. It's the deceiver. It's the serpent speaking in ways in your life. Let's think about that. Let's hold that to God in prayer. I believe that Jesus can help us be even more clever than that serpent in him. All right. Godspeed. We'll see you next time. We'll talk about moral autonomy next. Mm -hmm.